This is Pen Dust Radio. Welcome, all you literati, you lovers of words and tales, you who need a break in your hurried, harried lives. We have a salve for your soul with stories imaginative and original. Short stories, riveting fiction, and wildly creative nonfiction. Pen Dust Radio, definitely not the same old story. Please visit us at pendustradio.com. This podcast is a production of Rivercliff Books and Media. We publish literary fiction and creative nonfiction. Learn more at rivercliffbooks.com. Sometimes life comes full circle in the most unexpected ways, at the most unexpected times, in the most unexpected places. For Joe Nickerson, the unexpected arrives half the world round from where it began, along with a war and a woman. Bar Kafka is the gripping story of Joe's adventures after serving in Vietnam. We travel with him from Vietnam to Japan, and after he arrives home, from Los Angeles to New Jersey. Captivated by a stalwart, seductive, and enigmatic woman, he ultimately returns to Japan, which leads to a most unexpected encounter. Author Francis Duffy is a Yank who has lived abroad for decades. He currently resides on the homeland's periphery, Hawaii. This is a work of fiction. Bar Kafka. Written by Francis Duffy. Read by Paul Ulrich. Dread and wall shadows were all I knew in Plato's cave. Captors said we were lucky to have been born captive, warning, outside is far worse. They were infallible, so captives couldn't learn otherwise, except maybe teen males who were let out to fodder wars. If we survived, we'd return to the cave and attest that life elsewhere is indeed dire. I survived, but didn't return. War had provided escape velocity. Stayed abroad until my four-year enlistment was done, thrice declining orders to homeland bases. I wanted more of life elsewhere, even war zones, because they earned you R&R to other countries. What I saw confirmed, normal is relative, and my birth cave, medieval. Thirty years later, I revisited my hometown. Drove there with my foreign-born wife, my lifeline to now. I informed no one of our visit and left before sunset, fearing recapture. It had taken decades, but through college, travel, and hindsight, mined on long runs, I realized there had been another like me in that damn cave. Worse, he was a captor. Kneeling in the dark with fingers laced, I speak with Jesus through perforated plastic. Father Pharaoh sits with his head slumped on his right palm. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been one week since my last confession. These are my sins. I said four curse words. Twice I stole a quarter from Mom's purse. I talked back to Dad once. I boasted lies twice to friends. Three Hail Marys. Pharaoh growls, slamming shut a wood panel as I grin, and Jesus leans left to hear another's hooey. Father Pharaoh's speed as a confessor was the stuff of legend. A squat, coal-haired, thick-brogue Irish immigrant, you knew he was working when cars were double-parked near St. Paul's Church. Some sinners left their motors running. He was that fast. Each Saturday, they'd flock to the two unlit booths on either side of Pharaoh's confessional for the same reason McDonald's thrives. Convenience. He asked no questions, gave no advice, required no contrition, and only token penance. Other confessors dozed in their dark booths as sinners lined up for his no-fault absolution. Some drove from other parishes for a Pharaoh quickie rather than deal with priests who'd seek details, preach, and expect reform. I relied on him to interrupt, absolve, and dismiss before I'd finished reciting my weekly sin list. Of course, 
I saved the worst sin for last, although, as a virgin altar boy, mine rarely varied. The truth is, I invented most because nuns harped on how sinful we all are, so I felt laggard with too few. Curses were said, coins were stolen, fibs were told. Never with Pharaoh did I get to my dreaded impure thoughts before he'd dismiss me, which was why we lined up for him. For years, he'd hear the same schlock from serfs offloading guilt to the institution that had sown its seeds. He endured because sinners valued his fast-food absolution more than they minded his strange quirks. Pharaoh couldn't change their ways, so he didn't play the charade of trying. Yet, I wondered, is he harsh because we're sinners who won't change? Or, dare I even think this, does our sinning lack gusto in Pharaoh's eyes? Most who line up for him are adults offloading mortal sins versus my invented transgressions. Gruff in the confessional, Pharaoh was evasive outside of it. After Mass, if an altar boy spoke to him as he removed vestments in the sacristy, he'd turn away slightly, using the frame of his thick, black-rimmed glasses to block eye contact. Always bare-boned replies. My guess was Pharaoh didn't belong on stage, at least not a marble one, so he did ritual at warp speed to exit ASAP. Parishioners hoping to follow his mumbled Latin at Mass by reading from a missal couldn't keep pace. Altar boys dare not daydream lest we miss his hurried cues to ring bells, fetch wine and water, and respond in Latin. Trying to genuflect in sync with him was tricky because he'd barely bend a knee while charging through Catholicism's most sacred sacrament. A weekday Mass, no sermon or basket passing, normally takes 30 minutes. Blitzkrieg Pharaoh could do two in that time. An altar boy pal timed him one dark, snowy morning when Pharaoh did a mass at the parish convent in a howling eleven minutes. He blitzed the ritual as though miffed by having to perform at such an ungodly hour. Groggy nuns expecting the usual snoozer, mass flopped like flounders on the boat deck, unable to kneel, stand, or sit in unison. Pharaoh speed-mumbled sacred Latin devoid of punctuation or word spacing, then hurriedly plopped wafers on morning breath tongues as though running to catch a train. Yet, the nuns didn't complain, because Pharaoh scared them. Parishioners said he didn't mesh because he's a Celt from the old sod. In contrast, our other two priests and the parish Monsignor were U.S.-born Irish. After saying Mass, young fathers Deegan and Gogarty would banter with altar boys in the sacristy and sometimes join us at stickball in the schoolyard. Pharaoh mixed with no one we knew. Some said he'd cross swords with Monsignor Fartney, our haughty bishop wannabe who shared the parish's spacious three-story rectory with three subordinates and a housekeeper. Lush surrounding lawns were wide enough for touch football. Fartney drove a shiny black Buick, cultivated wealthy parishioners, and was offended by the working class. He showed a particular contempt for Mick families, sired by barfly dads and ruled by waitress moms. Families like mine. When report cards were distributed, his nibs would appear in one grade or another to hand students theirs. He'd enter a classroom bedecked in crimson and black power silks, nose high, as though wading among ring kissers. In fifth grade, I received my report card from Fartney. I thanked him as instructed, turned, and took two strides toward my desk before he said loud enough for all to hear, Tell your mother I'm still waiting for tuition for you and your sisters. That from a bird-leg potbelly who, as a result of nuns ordering students to badger parents for forced donations, flew to Florida each summer for a deep-sea fishing vacation, courtesy of parishioners. Fishing for tarts was Mom's view of his eminence. I didn't know Pharaoh and spoke with him only in confessional, but I admired the language of his behavior. Like him, I was quiet and wary, which caused eighth-grade classmates to vote me most likely to become a priest. Had he been herded to holy orders by obtuse classmates and family zealots like my maternal granny? She yearned for a priest in the family. Seven grandsons, yet none had shown signs of the calling. I was her last hope. She'd mail me scapulars, medals, holy cards, rosary beads, 
and tiny bottles of miracle water from Lourdes that I'd dab on my pitching arm. When she and Granddad visited, Nana would distract me from carnal TV dramas. As the hero is about to kiss the heroine, she'd ask, out of the blue, So, Joseph, what did you learn in catechism class today? Pharaoh was on the same team as our violent nuns and Fartney, but he self-ostracized, which awed me. He was a magnet for sinners, yet his indifference enabled their continued sinning. And the sinning continued, perhaps with increasing gusto, because we all knew he'd absolve and dismiss us before hearing our worst. It was unique as hell, but Pharaoh's behavior said he wanted to be elsewhere. Mine also, although I hadn't yet realized it. His ways were none of my business, and I was just a kid eyeing adult behavior, but even then, I noticed oddballs. He interested me not as a priest, but because Pharaoh seemed real and willful, traits nuns sought to eradicate from first grade. That's why I went to ground after Mother St. Elias face-whacked me for an unauthorized smile on day one at age seven. My first ever day in society taught me to show deadpan, speak monotone, evade beams from guard towers. Sounds harsh, yet years later in Japan, I'd learned that a low profile is their society's normal. He's black Irish, was how Mom explained Father Pharaoh. They're Celts, the original Irish before St. Patrick the Brit sold out Ireland to Rome's legions. Behind those legions came swarms of priests who'd convert at sword point. Underneath, Celts are still pagan. Parish grade school led to high school, a hospital janitor job after graduation, mail from the draft board, joining the Marines despite the Army, Paris Island, jet mechanic school, and Vietnam. I escaped a nun-run Stalag only to get shanghaied for war two years later. Joe Nobody, from Nowheresville, going nowhere via dead-end jobs equals cannon fodder. Swept up into a war tornado like Dorothy's house on her way to Oz. To defend democracy, so I assumed, male classmates enlisted before me. Especially boys who were rah-rah sis-boom-ba in high school, which I wasn't. Nuns described Catholics fleeing South Vietnam in fear of northern commies, so of course, Yank Catholics would lead the righteous war. Wrong. My high school class graduated 154 boys. Four of us served in Nam. Killed in action? One. Wounded in action? One. School jocks, student council officers, debate team boys, alphas, I assumed would lead, were no-shows. Using college as a storm cellar that Dorothy and I found locked against us. My generation's war ran longer than most. It spawned a decade-long, ocean-wide surge of troops and treasure flowing west between San Diego to Seattle in the U.S. to Subic Bay and Hokkaido in Asia. To remind us of what we were defending, Bob Hope brought starlets, jocks, comedians, and preachers to Nam each Christmas. For most likely to become a priest me, Hope's show paled beside the crimson silk hypocrisy of Cardinal Francis Spellman. America's top Catholic prelate, he visited Da Nang in mid-December to bless Marines, with the sign of the cross and sprinkled holy water, for killing godless communists. I read his words in Stars and Stripes, an obscenity that wouldn't let go. Rome had edited the Fifth Commandment, Thou shalt not kill unless we so order. Absolutes tainted with asterisks like Roger Maris's home run record. No such exceptions had been taught during a dozen years of daily catechism classes where I'd excelled and would have noticed split hairs. Spellman's atrocity made me appreciate Mom. In high school, she was keen that I read Huck Finn. It was an eye-opener. I searched the library for more of Mark Twain, finding The War Prayer, a darker work whose evil Spellman had echoed. Part of it read, O Lord our God, help us tear their soldiers to bloody shreds with our shells, to drown the thunder of the guns with the shrieks of their wounded writhing in pain, to lay waste their humble homes with a hurricane of fire, to wring the hearts of their unoffending widows with unavailing grief. War plus prayer equals hypocrisy. Listen up says Staff Sergeant Clements, the non-commissioned officer in charge of my F-4 Squadron's flight line at Da Nang Air Base. 
The day crew was arriving at 0600, and the night crew hadn't yet left. Bob hopes Christmas show is Monday, and of course we're all going, he says. Only problem is, one of us must stay to mind our warbirds. Some exchange unworried glances, knowing the latest arrival would get that shit detail. That means you, fucking new guy Cooper, Corporal Pittori says to the private who'd arrived last month, two after me. Cooper grins, knowing shit rolls downhill. Fear not, Coop, says Alexiani. We'll show you photos of Lola Falana shaking ass. Clem, I say to Clements, I'll stay. I got letters to write. Whoa, says Duke. Mofo Joe throws himself on a grenade to save Coop. Duke's grin tells me I won't have to explain further. The fact is, I was boycotting Hope's TNA show and Spellman's obscene theism. Nor was I in a rush to go home any longer. Having enlisted for four years and sent straight to war after aviation school, I'd still have more than two years to do after the first tour. Being a stateside Marine meant endless chicken shit from lifers at a remote base. Scant time for that at war. Plus, the only danger for airbase Marines was night rocket attacks, diddly compared with what grunts faced. So I chose war, boycotting hope while excavating dogma implanted daily by nuns who forbade questions. I extended my stay at war three times in six-month increments. This was longer than the 13 months required of Marines. I'd finish an extension with orders to a stateside airbase, Beaufort, South Carolina, Cherry Point, North Carolina, or Yuma, Arizona. I'd leave my squadron as though going home, but on Okinawa, I'd tell the admin clerks, I want to go back to Nam. On learning my military occupation was jet mechanic for F-4s, they complied, as F-4 Phantoms had become the war's workhorse. I was at Chu Lai for two more of Hope's Christmas shows. I boycotted both via the same shit detail. Self-ostracized like Father Pharaoh. Only when Relad, released from active duty, orders arrived would I return to the homeland. My zeal for it had ebbed, along with my theism. Always undermanned, we were too busy launching phantoms 24-7 in support of grunts to keep boots shined, hair trimmed, or shirt tails tucked. We constantly launched and recovered F-4s loaded with napalm, cluster bombs, rocket pods, daisy cutters, or a torpedo-sized gun pod centered under the plane's belly. Outside all day on a white concrete flight line, we were seared by tropic sun or bone-soaked by monsoons. Running, climbing, lifting, towing, refueling, changing tires, hand-hanging from an F-4's tail to stuff drogue parachutes with boots and conduct pre- and post-flight checks for battle damage. 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. for the day crew. Working shirtless during rains, we'd blow dry by standing on the edge of the jet exhaust from an idling phantom in between launching or recovering warbirds. All of us young, lean, and tireless. A small joy was reading The Stars and Stripes nightly, cover to cover. Changes at home I read about were apparent in Marines who arrived a year or more after I did. Unlike me, they'd enlisted already having anti-war and anti-military views but not enough to flee to Canada, go AWOL, or risk prison. Their gripes were less from ideology than vogue, donned like bell-bottoms and tie-dye. When women become anti-war, men follow, else they don't get dates. When women favor long hair on guys, even hippie-hating rednecks grow mullets. The music G.I.s brought from the world was post-Motown. Stones, Doors, LSD Beatles, and Acid Rock. For them, boozing was for lifers and rednecks. When off-duty, we'd sift apart. Juicers were pro-war, vaguely, anti-hippie, liked country and western music, and went to a thatch-roof club, also known as the Slop Shoot, every night for hours of warm beer. Heads were anti-war, vaguely, pro-hippie, liked rock music, and gathered in individual hooches. One evening after chow and a shower, I stopped by Rabbit's Hooch, located two over from mine. The hooches were wood shacks on stilts that kept them off the sand during monsoons with half-screen sides and plywood storm flaps. They housed six marines per shack. Hundreds of hooches sprawled on the seaside of Chulai Air Base, 
aligned in rows and linked by great metal pallets laid atop white sand. Dense with marines of 1A4 and 3F4 squadrons, plus various support units. Seated on a makeshift stool and on Rabbit's rack, Duke, Lutz, and Rabbit talked while listening to Inagata de Vida on tape. Three large posters were tacked above Lutz's rack. One shows a young blonde woman with a goofy look. After a few minutes listening to their chat, during a lull I ask, Who's she? Goldie Hawn, Lutz says. Then they resume their chat. At another lull I ask, Who's Goldie Hawn? They stop chatting and look at me like I must be joking. After a pause, Duke says, Joe, how long you been here? Two years and a few months, I say. Did you see Laugh-In before you left the world? Rabbit asked. No, is that a movie? They look at one another, then back at me. Dude, you've been gone too long, Lutz says. Duke says, Rip Van fucking Winkle. I came to war for nation. I extended not for nation, core, or the domino theory, nor for a conjured deity. The only reason left was the hope that the ordinance our F-4 phantoms delivered would help grunts avoid becoming KIA, WIA, MIA. Fuck the rest. War taught me what Father Pharaoh likely knew when he was bored, listening to our unoriginal sins. Gods and an afterlife are, at best, wishful thinking, and at worst, smoke and mirrors, which is why he blitzed the ritual. I suspect he was as godless then as I'd become. Yet, Pharaoh remained at his post in the Oz booth, working levers to keep the docile kneeling before cave shadows. Of course, I wasn't supposed to see what I saw. Pay no attention to that man behind the perforated plastic. The great, powerful Fartney has spoken. No longer Catholic, I couldn't figure why Pharaoh stayed till I recalled the terror a nun had implanted in me in high school. Sister Moxa stressed how fortunate we were to have been born Catholic. The rest of humanity is bound for everlasting hellfire, she assured my sophomore religion class. Questions during catechism class were forbidden in grammar school. But in high school, nuns might rarely be diverted from the day's dose of rote to answer a query, if gingerly worded. Moxa seemed spunkier than usual that early spring day. I raised my hand then stand when acknowledged. Sister, my neighbor said his father was Catholic but isn't anymore. How can that be? I said with false innocence. Moxa warmed to the challenge. Hell's worst depths are reserved for lapsed Catholic. She added that apostate priests are the lowest of the low. I wanted to ask about apostate nuns, but dare not. They who've been most blessed will be most damned if they reject God's call. She lets that sink in, knowing its effect on kids who, after graduation, will cease attending confession and mass till marriage, offspring, and the undertow of normalcy bring them back. Lapsed is passive, non-practicing. Apostate is active, rejection. I'm the latter. Fearing hell's depths, Pharaoh is neither. As the war escalated, Yank bases flourished in nearby nations to service weapons, and adjoining bar towns to service GIs. Most became ghost towns after Saigon fell, but while troops and treasure flowed from D.C., they were raucous boom towns. Wild, young, lusty ports, details of which can at home feared to learn. Wishful thinking families, who hugged the delusion that our crusade is righteous, based on lies from generals, blessings from clergy, and cave shadows from Bob Hope. After boycotting three at war, I finally saw Hope's Christmas show six months after discharge at Mom's Los Angeles apartment via NBC TV. Edited so zooms on mugs of horny GIs cheering for Lola's booty and Raquel's bazoom are read on the home front as zeal for the crusade. Our boys in white hats versus evil commies in black PJs. Psy War 101, deployed to keep fodder flowing from family to the military to war. Two years hence, U.S. Marine Corps Nam vet Daniel Ellsberg will expose the ruse via the Pentagon Papers, dispelling the delusion that propaganda, like a Claymore mine, 
is aimed only outward. I wasn't supposed to notice that either. The spring after discharge, when home from morning classes and before afternoon work as a janitor, I had heard Hope interviewed on the radio. He was being lauded for entertaining troops at war. It was a call-in show, and most praised him to high heaven. Except one, a World War II vet. Your Christmas shows were appreciated, he said, but you made millions from them in Korea and now in Vietnam. That, my friend, is what I call war profiteering. Hope's reply came too quick. The Pentagon has never paid me a dime for those shows. The caller had already been cut off, and the show's host didn't challenge America's darling. I said, aloud, Pentagon didn't, but NBC paid you millions. Regimented since age seven, I didn't need a Ph.D. to recognize herding. Corporate TV reaped tens of millions more than the millions it paid Hope for Christmas agitprop, logistics provided by the Department of Defense and sanctity by Spellman. In The War Prayer, Mark Twain wrote, In the churches, the pastors preached devotion to flag and country and invoked the God of battles, beseeching his aid and our good cause in outpourings of fervid eloquence which moved every listener. In exchange came a decade of body bags returning in escalating evening news numbers. Draft dodgers cowering in college hoped it would end before graduation. They scrambled to get bone spurs certified when it hadn't. Base-certified bars, brothels, eateries, and tailor shops were the interface through which Yanks and Asians mixed from dusk in scenes lit with pink neon and choreographed by Motown. Bar towns halfway around the globe from homes inhibitions where married GIs removed a wedding ring before leaving the base in droves to buy what they insist real men gotta have. Behavior that belies sermons, as with Fartney, Spellman, and Hope. God, country, and core, lifers would proclaim are the loyalties, wife excluded, a patriot must have. Ergo, patriarchy equals patriotism, females dismissed as Adam's spare rib. A point of view not restricted to the military, as I had learned thirteen years after discharge. While riding Tokyo's Yamanote line commuter train with a Yank professor, Ph.D., wife, two kids, three years my elder, draft dodger, and my employer, he declared, Any man who doesn't cheat on his wife is either a liar or unable to attract women. He's theist, I'm not. Yet he excludes marital fidelity as a third option, behavior that belies. He cheats, and, bothered that I don't, is keen that I adopt his version of normal. Why does my compliance matter? I saw how males bond years before college or war when mom sent me, at age nine, into the Starlight Tavern on a payday to fetch dad. She'd let our taxi go and stood outside in cold drizzle as he bought drinks for men whose interest in him would end when freebies ceased. In my teens... Male peers sought underage beer and cigarettes. Son of a drunk, I'd decline both. If they pressed me, I'd avoid them. I'd like to believe no one taught me such, that it's just me. But in fact, I was self-ostracizing, like Father Pharaoh and Mark Twain. Two squadrons I served with in Nam were among several that took turns rotating to a marine air station at Iwakuni, Japan for three-month stays to repair battle-scarred phantoms, update the gear, and train crews. In Nam, air-wing marines weren't supposed to exit the base, but 90 days in Japan gave me time to explore in ever-widening circles. Such was the start of me going gook, as marines say, although I date it farther back to Spellman's blessing and, in hindsight, to Pharaoh's confessional. Later, in college, I'd learned that deracination is how science labels the process. To lose one's roots, dictionaries explain, only I don't see the process as one of subtraction, but rather addition. My roots are intact, enhanced through exposure to cultures unlike that into which I'd been born. A Tom Robbins novel I read in college said it best. Perhaps the most terrible or wonderful thing that can happen to an imaginative youth, aside from the curse or blessing of imagination itself, is to be exposed without preparation to the life outside his or her own sphere, the sudden revelation that there is a there out there. 
war revealed much, as did Mitch. After two 90-day rotations to Japan, before finally receiving release from active duty orders, I took two five-day R&Rs to Tokyo. From there, I rode a night train many hours southwest to visit a certain woman I'd met when my squadron was at Iwakuni. Marines had warned, steer clear of that bitch. Better men than you have re-upped for her, only to be dumped after she pockets his re-enlistment bonus. She's heartless. Their warnings drew me to her lair, the Bar Kafka. Owned by an Australian who, as part of Allied Occupation Forces, had parachuted into the area soon after Nagasaki's A-bomb ended his generation's war. He returned as a civilian and became fluent in Japanese. He was based in Kobe, where he'd founded an import business that thrived with Japan's resurgence. He soon outgrew Iwakuni as larger affairs kept him at Kobe, leaving the bar Kafka well-managed and staffed. The Aussie knew that GI bars thrived during wars. He made sure his was classier than most. It wasn't an O-bar, for officers only, or a hee-haw joint for rednecks. Bar Kafka's women dressed to kill. Their scheming ways spooked G.I.s who'd rather buy quick sex on Creep Street than risk the silken webs of women like Mitch. Mitch was as close as G.I.s could get to pronouncing her given name, Michiko. Her defenses were indeed daunting, like Everest eyed from its base camp. From a stool at the bar's end, I'd nurse a weak drink while watching her pluck G.I. turkeys in over in the booths. Taller than most, she'd wear short black dresses showcasing legs that stole male breath when she clip-clopped in backless lame heels to fetch drinks from bar to booth. High-collared dresses leave much to the male imagination in a culture where eloquence is what's left unsaid. The three women in bar Kafka, Mitch, half-Aussie Yumi, and Naomi, all wore off-black, bangs-to-eyebrow wigs. Seductive makeup black lighting, and the effects of booze left most clients unable to recognize them during daylight hours around the village. Few G.I.s went off base during days only working hours anyway, enabling bar women to do chores without war paint and wigs. Son of matriarchy, I was used to unfettered females. As a teen, I'd been surprised by male peers who spoke of girls as though they were a subspecies. Not in my family. Son of a drunk, I went to the enlisted club in Nam once, and never again. Thatch roof on a long cinder block room, dense with shit-faced guys at circular tables moaning for home over warm beer. But when my squadron rotated to Japan, I'd bar hop religiously, because of the women therein. Mitch didn't smoke or drink, save for whiskey-colored water. Her sorcery was denying males fruition, yet most would return, keen to try again. She made guys laugh while thwarting them, each thinking he had an inside track to her sanctum. Emotionally, her drawbridge was rarely down. Like mine, since that face whack for an unauthorized smile at age seven. My squadron's mail clerk was sent in shackles to Leavenworth Penitentiary for stealing from fellow Marines' envelopes, much of which he spent buying Mitch pricey water. She placed his wad of yen notes unfolded in his shirt pocket so she could access them as she downed colored water and he drank beer. When his yen was gone, she'd hail him a cab, warn him not to cheat on her, and send him back to the base. Guys like that paid just to be seen with Mitch at a popular eatery after the bars closed. That sounds like fiction, yet such is why the military drafted males still living with their parents. Get them before they learn otherwise. Naifs of patriarchy were easy prey in the bar Kafka. Mitch and I would glimpse one another at midnight eateries as I dated her peers and she dated mine. During rare lulls at bar Kafka, she'd ease her dolphin thighs onto the stool next to mine for verbal sparring, without requiring that I buy her tea water. Why do you watch me? she said, pretending she didn't know why. Her candor caught me off guard. I... I admire you, I said, pretending I wasn't smitten. I admired how she handled herself in the violent patriarchies into which all of us are born. As I admired Father Pharaoh's willful ways in my parish and my mom, who kept our family together despite a no-account spouse and merciless clergy, before welfare, before women's lib. Eventually, we paired. 
After the bars closed, we'd walk to the Anchor restaurant on the Imazu River for midnight suppers. We'd talk for hours. She about putting a younger brother through college since her father died, me about my hard-working mom and boozy father, and being the only son in a female-dominant family. After weeks of oblique probing, she finally said, So you know women. Her eyes on mine, but face unsmiling, unreadable. I couldn't tell if it was a question, statement, complaint, or challenge. I sensed the moment's importance, but didn't reply. Couldn't reply. Speaking seemed less expressive than eyes. Frost spread on candlelit windows as our waiter waited for us to leave so we could close. Sleep didn't matter for us, yet I could tell she wasn't close to trusting me. Her interest was as high as I could aim. After walking Mitch near to her tiny house, but not close enough to learn its location, I'd forego a taxi in winter to speed walk the mile plus to my base Quonset hut, scheming on her all the way. Being from Italian-dominant New Jersey, I dressed to please women, an advantage when among jarheads who think this is unmanly. Most would chow after work, change their uniform to PX civvies, then leave the base to get drunk. Some didn't bother to shower, much less dress to please women. They're just whores, why bother? Clad in chinos and short sleeve shirts, a ciggy pack rolled into the sleeve to bear a born-to-raise-hell tattoo, they'd bar hop as a loud group then staggered back to the barracks well before midnight. Some slept hugging barf-splashed toilet bowls. For sex, these macho studs would bond by queuing at an alley dive off Creep Street known as the Hog Farm, paying to take turns atop the same woman. Next! Marines, also frat boys and team jocks, came to mind years later in grad school while reading Gertrude Stein. Men fear women. They fear each other, they fear their neighbor, they fear other countries, and then they hearten themselves by crowding together and following each other, and when they crowd together and follow each other, they are brutes, like animals who stampede. Not me. After chow, I'd shower and nap to refresh the gray matter for a night of what a black pal called scheming on them hamlets. Arise, turn on Motown, dress to kill. Choose like a gigolo from suits and turtlenecks made at tailor shops as per GQ. Japanese women were keen for all things hippie. Linen shades, thin strands of day-glow neck beads, rings, middle-parted hair, and fabrics that sizzle under black lights and hip bars. None was hipper than the bar Kafka, where Mitch kept its jukebox ripe with the latest. I'd bar hop solo. Enter, pause for effect, glide to a stool at bar's end, and sip absinthe. Wrap-around shades allow me to watch her without turning my head. Women fetching drinks for booth turkeys would pick a slot between bar stools. I'd hear the clip-clop of Mitch's LeMay heels, inhale her as she leaned close, brushing me ever so slightly. A wisp known only to us. My garb and modus operandi earned jeers from Creep Street jarheads. He's pussy-whipped. These macho buyers of street sex would guffaw in the mornings in our Quonset hut as they gulped black java for their hangovers. Gertrude Stein, they are brutes like animals who stampede. Iwakuni rocked in those war-fueled years when a dollar bought you 360 yen, so even a corporal could rent a place off base. Some GIs took up ranching, paying the rent of a barwoman to stay at her place each night. That left ranchers enough yen to booze it up and bond with pals while avoiding risky bars like the Kafka, whose artful women were deemed insufficiently servile. When a war-torn F-4 squadron arrived from Nam with hundreds of starved males, the villa outside base became Woodstock, dense with youth flowing like lava from the base's main gate. Walk a narrow two-lane street a quarter mile to the intersection at four corners and straight another quarter mile to three corners then right on to Creep Street. Slinky women vogue pose outside bars to lure G.I.s streaming by as Indian males hawk before tailor shops. The street leading from the base's main gate has so many hole-in-the-wall bars that some jarheads who exit the gate by 7 p.m. to bar hop can't even reach four corners before staggering back to base shit-faced. 
To get as far as three corners before bars close, 11 p.m., requires prudence. A young buck thinking he'll stop at a bar for a quick drink with pals gets targeted by a vamp keen to separate him for plucking. She pats his thigh while laughing at jokes she doesn't understand, or asking him what born to raise hell means. If he's dumb enough to flash his whole wad of yen when paying for drinks, she calculates how long he'll have her attention. During a three-month posting to Iwakuni, most jarheads won't go much beyond that half-mile of bars, eateries, and tailor shops before circling back to their bunks and Quonset huts on our Little America base. It has everything G.I. should need. Chow halls, post office, PX, commissary, sick bay, cinema, bowling alley, chapel, and chaplains, plus clubs with booze aplenty. Yet, at dusk, the village lures them, like Greeks to sirens. Young adults, Yank and Asian, far from their hometown taboos. No kin, classmates, neighbors, catechism, or clergy to hinder. Well beyond the pale. Winter, warmed by youth's hormones, booze, and the proximity of small bars. Exit one, cross the street or round a corner to another. This was decades before opioids, cocaine, speed, meth, and just before pot. Don't need a car because the village is walking distance. Plus, scotch taxis are plentiful and cheap. Shore Patrol cruises in covered navy gray pickup trucks, returning the rare rowdy drunk to base quietly so even his unit may be none the wiser, much less kin halfway around the globe. Mitch, somebody should write a book about Iwakuni. She heard that often, especially from career officers who'd been posted to Asia's raunchier GI towns. Let loose like we dare not at home before fate sends us back to a war whose logic we've lost. Single women came from all over Japan to earn good money, have fun, and be wooed by foreign devils. They wanted in on the hippie boom. I'd enter a bar, and a lithe hostess wearing granny glasses would inform me that she had the latest Doors album, so let's listen after midnight. Unlike Michiko, known to failed conquerors as Bichiko, the first time I returned from Nam via a five-day R&R, a long journey specifically to see her, we had midnight suppers as usual, but no more than a single goodnight kiss amid light snow. On my second R&R, a month before I returned to the USA for discharge after 33 months abroad, she let me stay at her house, on the condition that I sleep fully clothed above covers as she sleeps below them. I'd met my match. Mom and my sisters had fled New Jersey to Los Angeles before I had left for Nam, so I need return no farther than there to be home. But my circle felt incomplete until I reached New Jersey, where my coast-to-coast hitchhike with orders to war had begun. The day after Neil Armstrong stepped into moon dust, I started the CA to NJ hitch. Could have gone Greyhound, but I wanted to see the land. And a certain confessor. He was a dozen years or so, my senior, but war had etched me closer to his age. Returning amid anti-war fervor, after Mi Lai and before Kent State, I wanted Father Pharaoh to show me Yahweh's will in Vietnam. Napalm. Carpet bombings. Fraggings. Hope's TNA shows. Agent Orange. Spellman. Hear my sins. Offload guilt. Absolve. He was long gone when I reached St. Paul's. No one knew his current posting, but a pal home from college said Pharaoh had been ill and was moved to a Missouri parish years earlier. Nor could I ask Monsignor Fartney. Just back after 33 months at war, my every other sentence contained an obscenity de rigueur for Marines. It would be years for that to ebb. I'd planned to stay for two weeks but left after one. After Asia and California, New Jersey seemed old world. A year after discharge, I returned to Iwakuni during summer break from my first year of college to disprove a certain woman's prophecy. When I'd visited Michiko via those R&Rs from Nam, she'd observed that no GI had ever returned to Iwakuni after discharge and returning to the USA. Many had griped about lifers when they were first-termers, yet they re-upped and became lifers to afford marriage with women they met at Iwakuni. None had returned as a free and clear civilian, ever. 
Once you're back among American blondes, Mitch forecast, you'll forget. Out of sight, out of mind. Not quite. As a morning collegian, an afternoon janitor, and a night school student of Japanese, I bunked on Mom's sofa to afford summer airfare to Tokyo. Lessons included writing and reading Japanese to send Mitch letters. Come June, I arrive at Iwakuni two hours prior, via bullet train from Tokyo. But I wait, jet-lagged yet pulse gone wild, at an Indian friend's tailor shop. I know from 6 p.m. she'll be where she's become infidel to empty words from males. We'd been writing, so she knows I was due in yesterday, today, or tomorrow. There were no clients when I opened Bar Kafka's door that muggy evening. Hair to shoulders, elephant bell-bottoms on old denim, and a fringe stash bag on my belt. Mitch was standing with her back to the door in a far corner, speaking with Naomi. Her jaw dropped and eyebrows arched on seeing the villa's first-ever long hair. Knowing from Naomi's face it must be me, Mitch turned, already beaming a smile I'd not been shown prior. More breathtaking, the look in her eyes as she clip-clops toward me. Emotion that drawbridge people rarely show. No embrace. Japan's norm of public decorum fits me better than does that of my heart-on-sleeve homeland. Used to only G.I. buzz cuts, Mitch and Naomi fuss with the Buddha curls of my Irish afro. The Japanese pay for perms to curl hair, so they assumed I have had mine done. She gives me the key to her house, saying I should bathe and sleep. I do, till awoken near midnight by that smile in those eyes. For Joe Nobody, from Nowheresville. A week later came my first Toto We're Not in Kansas Anymore moment. While watching local TV one sultry afternoon with Mitch and Mickey, a neighbor who handles the cash behind Bar Kafka's counter. It's a daily how-to program for housewives, this day demonstrating cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Several women from the audience have volunteered to learn CPR skills, then practice on a victim lying on a table. The instructor diagrams the technique on the blackboard, then monitors each woman as she tries it on the patient. I can't follow the rapid Japanese dialogue, so I don't know why Mitch and Mickey suddenly are laughing. Then I see the volunteers are also giggling. The camera pans from them to the beet-red face of the victim, a college-age male. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth from women leaning over him has triggered a normal response, an erection. In my homeland, such a scene would have been edited out, to say the least. But the Japanese see no sin in nature. More astounding, the camera pans slowly from the lad's closed-eyed, blushing mug down his torso to the bulge in his beige chinos. The host, housewife, CPR instructor, Mitch, and Mickey are howling. Only, I'm agog. Twelve years of road catechism haven't prepared me for this. Jeez, I say while thinking, how would I confess the sin of having watched that? Seeing me flushed and wide-eyed, Mitch snuffs what remains of my theism with a Cheshire smile. Welcome to Japan, Joey boy. I stayed with her that summer and the next, then transferred to a Jesuit-run university in Tokyo for a senior year with a scholarship, then was hired by a newspaper. I returned to the USA only for grad school, then abroad again. My response to love it or leave it. My turncoat homeland, where draft dodgers, the Viet Cong, and the NVA were now described in heroic terms and native sons who served and died were scorned as baby killers. That was why two Marines I served with in Nam left for home, yet both returned to war within a year, voluntarily. It's ass backward at home, Joe, Lentini said. We're supposed to be ashamed for serving as we were raised to do. Ain't that some strange shit, Duke said. When war vets come back to Mofo Nam rather than stay where they ached to be when they were here for their first tour... It proves something seen on Zippo lighters GIs used at war. We are the unwilling, led by the unqualified, doing the unnecessary for the ungrateful. Like me, Mitch was born into a matriarchal family within a patriarchal society. Her parents had divorced, which is dire for offspring in Japan, 
where it happens far less than in my homeland. In Japan's logic, divorce implies character flaws in both spouses. Their offspring would have that held against them when applying to universities and firms when applying for jobs. Mitch was like Scarlett O'Hara post-war, determined to succeed without having to depend on males. I know this about her because she visited San Francisco during my third year of college there. Gone with the Wind was showing at an artsy neighborhood theater. I'd neither read the book nor seen the film, knowing scant of its plot. Mitch had read the book in Japanese but had not yet seen the movie. Three hours and fifty-eight minutes. Mitch often leans forward on the edge of her seat, eyes gleaming. She's smiling, and I know it's not for Rhett, but for Scarlet. The movie ends, lights come on, and the audience files out. We move to better seats, take a pee break, get more popcorn, and watch it again, all three hours and 58 minutes. I ask as we walk to the car, Okay, you're Scarlet, but am I Rhett or Ashley? She smiles, tilts head slightly to the left while hiss intaking air, then says, So desne. Indecision meant to tease, I hope, rather than infer I'm more latter than former. When her brother graduates college, Mitch will finance him and their mother by owning and running a clothing store in Fukuoka to ensure their income after she quits the bar wars. She had no intention to take off from work just because I'd returned. But she did spare a few days that first summer to take me to Beppu, a coastal city famous for its thermal springs. It's where her grandparents and an aunt share a house on Japan's southernmost main island of Kyushu. We take a bullet train there and settle into an upstairs room of a new home in a sedate neighborhood. The next day, she takes me to a spa where we're buried side by side in warm black lava sands, our heads wrapped in white towels. That night, on a futon spread across tatami mats, she awes me. I bought the land and had this house built for them. Even if I marry and move to America, this room will always be waiting for me. The son of such a woman, I know when to be silent. I do not have to stay with any man who doesn't deserve me. We're laying on our sides, each propped on an elbow, my head on right hand and hers on her left, eyeball to eyeball. Her words are meant to intimidate, so I quell a smile that would reveal my admiration. For not, as she reads my eyes and blush. War tornado had brought me to an Oz where nonverbal communication is far richer than in my heart-on-sleeve homeland. Where emotions are covert, sincerity treasured, and a spoken yes could mean an unsaid no. Values not inscrutable for one who, face-whacked at age seven for an unauthorized smile, had rigged a defense M.O., quell emotion, poker face, read behavior. If, seeking agreement, you question a Japanese person and their response is to hiss intake air, tilt their head like the RCA dog and say, so desu ne, withdraw your query. Based on their customs, saying no would be rude. If instead you press them to agree with your point of view, as you might with a fellow Yank, you may finally receive a limp yes. Most likely, it means they understand your perspective even though they disagree but don't want to offend by saying so. In college, I'd visit the library most evenings to do homework, then use the card catalog to research all things Japanese. Shared values motivate behavior, so I was keen to learn Japan's version of normal, Judeo-Christian for Yanks and Euros, Buddhist, Shinto, and Neo-Confucian for Japanese. The best sources were not translations of Japanese writing for other Japanese, but non-Japanese writing immersed in Asia that could translate concepts and values alien to those born in the West. Donald Ritchie nailed the thrill of being a gaijin living in Japan. Like a child with a puzzle, I am forever putting pieces together and saying, of course. That summer in Iwakuni, after my first year of college, I lived in the villa and couldn't go on base even if I'd wanted to. The mouse had outgrown its baseboard hole. Bar Kafka was off-limits because my presence would hinder Mitch. Nor did I bar hop or drink. I'd watch sumo wrestling till 6 p.m., 
have the best BLT west of California at Sacos on Three Corners, jog some evenings along the Imazu River's bank, or visit an Indian friend's tailor shop for long talks. I even ran into two Marines I'd served with in Nam. Marine Corps Air Station Iwakuni is a strategic U.S. base in East Asia. Marines and sailors who became lifers were likely to be posted there more than once. Both had re-upped and were sad characters. Ron Mickle was shoved through a plastic sliding window of an eatery where I was having gyoza. He'd been fighting in an adjacent alley. Short of stature, his upper torso landed on top of an empty table next to mine. Me being the only long hair in a villa full of buzz cuts, he was stunned when he looked up to apologize. More so when I grinned and ID'd myself. He'd lost rank since I knew him two years earlier in Squadron 122. Another was shit-faced and singing way too loud while stumbling solo toward Creep Street on a warm night. I heard him before I saw him and immediately recognized his nasal voice. I'd last seen him at Chu Lai in Nam three years prior. I jogged to where he was weaving in the shadow between two low-watt streetlights erected too far apart. Sergeant Schlaff, I said when ten yards away. With the streetlight behind me and him in the shadows, he sees a tall silhouette approaching, hair to shoulders, wearing hippie garb. I could tell by his face he spooked. Don't recognize me, do you? I say. He shakes his head in agreement. Joe Nickerson, formerly a corporal when you and I were with the 115 at Chulai. He seems to recognize my name, but my appearance is too unlike the jarhead he once knew by that name. We weren't pals in Nam, just co-workers, so I don't press the matter. Besides, he's too drunk. Tomorrow he'll think I was a hallucination. A week later, near the very same spot, I'm talking with Murley, an Indian friend, on a muggy night in front of his tailor shop, located midway between four corners and three corners. Marines and sailors on payday night liberty flow by, bar hopping to shed taboos brought from distant hometowns. Some will wind up haggling with streetwalkers on Creep Street, wedding rings left in the barracks as though adultery ain't a sin when done with a pagan. I hear a guy singing among a group of G.I.s emerging from darkness toward the moth buzz neon in Murley's shop window. What catches my ear is the tenor's brogue. As a lad, I'd confessed mock sins as he sat and I knelt in darkness, each whispering lies through perforated plastic. I don't need light to recognize Father Pharaoh. He nods to Murley as his group passes. I ask the tenor's name. That's Chief Pharaoh, Murley says, Navy corpsman who works at the base hospital. I've made suits for him. Is he a chaplain? Him? Are you kidding? He's been married to a Japanese woman and divorced. A big drinker, likes to party and sings like an angel. I heard he was wounded in Nam as a battlefield medic. Got a medal for bravery. A silver ribbon or something. Silver star, I say, while turning to look at what I cannot believe. And a purple heart. Doubting my senses, I jog up close behind Pharaoh's group as they walk toward three corners. When he's in its rear rank, I near him and speak in the only way we'd ever communicated. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been ten years since my last confession. He stops on a dime turns to face me, and seems instantly sober. His loud pals keep walking, unaware of my arrival or his halt. Pharaoh's black Irish hair is shorter and flecked with gray. Mine is a bushy afro. I've got mutton-chop sideburns, a bandito mustache. I'm wearing hippie bell-bottoms. He's slimmer and noticeably etched by this damn war. I was in fifth or sixth grade when last he'd heard my unoriginal sins. Brow furrowed, he squints at me through black-rimmed glasses as though peering down a kaleidoscope, trying to fathom shifting bits of colored glass. He'll not recognize me by my appearance, so I say the usual. I said seven curse words, twice stole coins from Mom's purse, told three lies, and... I think he'll punch me, but instead, Chief Pharaoh throws his head back and roars laughter. Then... He blesses me with the sign of the cross, absolving my sins. Three Hail Marys. Next.
My homeboy apostate turns and is singing again as he rejoins his pals. I stand, watching what I can't yet grasp. At three corners, Pharaoh and pals turn right onto Creep Street. I turn and look up the street toward Bar Kafka. If not for her, I wouldn't see him. If not for war, neither. This story was first published by Eclectica Magazine, July-August 2019. Thanks for listening to this episode of Pen Dust Radio. For more information or to submit your writing to the podcast, please visit pendustradio.com. This podcast is a production of Rivercliff Books and Media. Learn more at rivercliffbooks.com. The story featured in this episode is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents are the products of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. Any resemblance to actual events, locales, 